Evan, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, we're really excited about this one because, as you may know, if you're a regular uh, viewer of our webinars, we've been doing a lot over the last couple of months, mainly focused on Asia. And this is the first one we've done in the US. And as Gallon Growth has expanded our coverage to the US, this seems like a great opportunity to understand a little bit more about what's going in that on in that huge uh, health car, healthcare market. And I was just looking at a few stats, probably the biggest healthcare market in the world. Uh, in terms of VC funding going into ventures, at least 55 billion and counting. And uh, by our reckoning, over 2000 healthcare ventures operating just in the US. And if you compare that to Asia, by our reckoning are about two and a half thousand in Asia. So the US on its own is almost the size of, of, of our part of the world. So I'm speaking to you from Singapore and I'm really excited to have four really fascinating and interesting startups from the US. Uh, I've been looking at what they're offering and uh, their websites and their video interviews, really, really interesting solutions to problems facing the US market. So I'm going to hand over in a second. Um, so we have Ray, Chrissa, Howard, and Jamie. Uh, what we're going to do in the next hour is a quick introduction. Um, and if the panel can give us a quick elevator pitch of you, your venture, also just where you are right now in the US, just to give us a little bit of flavor for that. We are going to come back after that and go through your ventures and just learn a little bit more about your experience of your venture and what you're achieving and what you set out to solve uh, in the US. And then we'll wrap up towards the end with some more general questions. Uh, one of the big ones is COVID. And of course the US has been a lot in the headlines and the international news, uh, especially around COVID. Um, and is it a different stage than we are in, in Asia? So very interested to learn more about that experience in the US amongst other things. So with that, I'm going to hand over for an intro to our panel. Um, Ray, over to you first, perhaps, to give us a bit of, a, give a bit of an intro. All right, put me on first. All right, let's see what we can do. Uh, thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Ray Costantini. I'm the CEO and co-founder at BrightMD. Uh, quick background on myself, internal medicine trained physician here in the US. Uh, spent a decent amount of time working at large health systems before starting BrightMD. And we're really... Um, we are an enabler of telehealth, but in a very different way. Uh, so think of us more as really a care automation platform that helps streamline the care delivery process. So unlike telehealth, that's important and valuable because it can remove geography as a barrier to care. What care automation does and what Smart Exam, our flagship product does, is really streamline the clinical process. So instead of, think of us kind of like a, a virtual medical resident. A patient wants to get care from their doctor and uh, they log in from their phone at home. And rather than having to line things up and get on a video, uh, that, that login triggers that virtual medical resident to go into the electronic medical record system, pull out meds, allergies, problem list, visit histories, use all of that along with contextual information like location, seasonality, to then drive a conversational AI interview of that patient. So the clinicians don't need to be spending all that time gathering that information. And we're actually able to be more thorough than a clinician would be able to be in a telephonic video or in-person setting, asking two to three times as many relevant uh, and situationally specific questions. But then we take all of that information and we translate it into a differential diagnosis and a chart note, a set of evidence-based treatment recommendations, prescriptions, orders, referrals. So, um, we made we put that in front of the clinician, who is then spending just a few minutes. It's about uh, 15 to 20 times more efficient because we've done all of that work for the clinician. They're delivering that care remotely, often from their phone as well, without ever having to turn on video or synchronously connect with the patient. Uh, and then all of the documentation from that is done. So it's literally about two minutes of clinician time as compared to 20. Uh, so a massive multiplier on capacity. And in particular, in a sitting like COVID, uh, where utilization has gone up pretty substantially, we've seen health systems able to ramp on our platform in an hour 
uh, up to thousands of visits a day with just quick training with their clinicians, about 30 to 60 minutes of total training to get proficient on the platform. So. Awesome. Fantastic. And uh, look forward to hearing a little bit more in a second, Ray. Um, to, where are you based? Portland, Oregon. Uh, for those not in the United States, that's just above California. Great. <laughs> thanks. My geography of the US is not great. So thanks, thanks for that. Uh, um, yeah. Awesome. Chris, uh, Patientory, tell us a little bit about you and Patientory. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Chris McFarlane, founder and CEO of Patientory. Um, we're located in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we're basically a patient population health management um, software system um, that utilizes and runs on a HIPAA compliant blockchain enabled health information storage and exchange network um, called P2E Matrix, which right now has the ability and capacity to aggregate data from over 10,000 health systems. That's roughly about 200 million Americans or 90% of the population mm -hmm. for which our enterprise app is able to derive intelligence and analytics um, for chronic disease management and improve patient reported outcomes um, using our care plan app system, as well as provide consumers um, with insights into their health data and a longitudinal record um, of their medical information, regardless of what platform. So whether that's an electronic medical record, medical device, or wearable device, we're able to aggregate that information seamlessly. Fantastic. And just for the benefit of our age audience, HIPAA, which I know is a big topic in the US, but could you just explain HIPAA for us? Yeah, so HIPAA, I would say, <laughs> is the big um, regulatory framework around the privacy and security of PHI, private health information. Um, I would say, I would liken it to GDPR in Europe, um, which is but it's heavily much more stringent um, as it relates to access and patient information. Cool. Great. Okay. Thanks for that. And uh, look forward to hearing some more in a second. Uh, Jamie, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Cloudbreak. Yeah, Matt, thank you. Uh, great to be here. And uh, it's always awesome to be on these panels where you actually learn something from the other guests too. So I'm looking forward to digging in with uh, Chris Array and Howard uh, on, on uh, their expertise. Um, Cloudbreak is a unified telemedicine company. Uh, that really focuses on healthcare disparity solutions. So our goal is to level the playing field for patients who sometimes have other social determinants of health and challenges and can't level it for themselves. Uh, we started off by bringing language interpreters, certified medical interpreters to the point of care over telemedicine. And uh, now the product has expanded. We're in 1200 hospitals across the country. We do around 85,000 encounters a month on over 10,000 video endpoints. Uh, which makes us one of the larger telemedicine companies in the United States. And our goal, again, is really focused on how do we use that technology to fix the inequities uh, that are in the healthcare system. And so it started off with just language interpreters, but now we're actually doing telestroke. Uh, we're bringing specialists into communities that typically haven't had access to those specialists so that that patient can remain in their community and in their care support network and don't necessarily have to be transferred to a higher level of care. Um, during COVID, we actually allowed our devices and pioneered a new use case called telequarantine so that our devices could be rolled into the patient room and the doctor then didn't need to go into the room to treat the patient around on the patient. They could do it from outside and clearly that one helped lower R0 or the risk of contagion, uh, but two, it also helped lower the usage of PPE, which was scarce around the globe in terms of masks, gloves, gowns, um, and those types of items. So uh, we've now expanded the platform so that we can surround a patient with their entire care continuum. Our belief on telemedicine is that it should enable the existing continuum of care, not create a new one. And so the mission is to continue to build out new use cases on the platform so that we can continue to build more and more uh, of a continuum around that patient. Fantastic, great. Look, look forward to hearing more about that. Um, Howard, over to you. I'm really interested in, in LifeWire. <laughs> and um, as a supplementary question, um, it would be great if you could just give us a bit of an overview, very top level, just of the US care system. I know that's a big question, but perhaps if you could just give us the helicopter view of how the, I think most of us have heard of things like Medicare and Medi Medicaid and things like that, but just to explain a little bit about that would be awesome. But maybe to start with, with you and LifeWire. Yeah, yeah so I'm just a little overwhelmed with the, you said we had one hour? 
to discuss this because I just did the Medicare Medicaid question. I sort of we need to book more satellite time. I think we need talk volumes to Zoom. of books. Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So uh, very quickly, uh, as a background, uh, traditional health IT background, I'm educated as an MBA, international finance and marketing. Naturally, with that, I spent 25 years producing film and television, which naturally led to health IT, which is what is, has become LifeWire. And what life and uh, location wise were offices in both Toronto, Canada and Arlington, Virginia, which is just outside of Washington, DC. And just as a heads up, I'm actually speaking to you from a remote island in Northern Ontario, uh, where we've actually had to put up a 40 foot booster to increase the cellular signal so we can actually do this call. So I apologize for any dropouts. Uh, what LifeWire is, essentially it's a last mile connectivity with the patient. So it's a cloud-based communication platform that allows patients and providers have discussions literally face-to-face, -face, but on an automated remote basis. Fundamentally, and lead to communication, you want to reduce the barriers of communication. So patients could choose whatever device that they want. So it could be a cell phone, a tablet, a computer, even a landline if they want, or even a flip phone. And they choose how they want to communicate, text, email, interactive voice, chat, instant messaging. We now tie into over 400 wearables medical devices. This is all instantaneous. There's no software, there's no equipment. It's truly using the power of the cloud. And what is being communicated are the workflows of our clients, the clinicians. So whatever they're doing, we're automating those outcomes, reducing the use of human resource and automating response systems as an, on an interactive basis. We're also able to collect uh, prescription information, lab data. So we have multi-levels, layers of uh, a collection of information for the clinicians or our clients. To that very tiny question that you asked about the US uh, healthcare system, um, and I, so, and Ray and Jamie and Chris can very help me with this, but the simple, and I quote in very quotation marks, simple explanation is the U.S. healthcare system, you mentioned Medicaid. So Medicaid is a government program that leads to those who have income levels below, I think it's an average family income of around seventeen or $18,000. You have Medicare, which is a government program, which for those who are people over 65000 uh, 65 years old. Then you've got the private insurance area that fills in the middle, which is the payers, pay, payer system like United Healthcare, um, Anthem, those kind of companies. And so you have a combination of private and public in a variety of, of elements. Um, in terms of you hear about the U.S. being a private care system, um, just because of the two comparisons up in Canada, the per capita spend per person is $4,500 per year. In the U.S., the per capita government spend is approximately $10,000 per year in the U.S. So there's actually a lot of government spend, but it's a tremendous amount of private. And to say there's a bureaucracy in between, I think, is putting it, saying it lightly. Right. Okay. And, and, and so, Howard, you so forgot the job. VA and the Department of Defense and the private pay model, all of which are live and active in the United States as well. So That's great. Yes, yeah, so you have the department. So the VA, which manages, supposedly manages 25 million in your lives, uh, five, 25 million in total, 5 million on any active basis. Department of Defense manages 7 million uh, active duty personnel in their families. Mm -hmm. And you've got the private system on top of that. Yeah. And so IHS. Our, our, and, oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Don't and, and even go there. Sorry. <laughs> then, you, then you get the state. Then that's just federal. Then you have state level and local mm -hmm. level. And so, so our job, the four of us, is to sort of navigate some of that um, to provide support for patients. Great. Awesome. So, Thank you for that. Listen, I'm not going to ask you any detailed questions, but I think <laughs> let's, let's, let's leave it at that. Just, just, just to clarify, I had yeah. hair before all this started, so... <laughs> Yeah, it sounds complicated, um, but thanks. I think we've got a bit more of an understanding of it. So th thank you for that. Hey, so listen, guys, so I, I'm really interested to hear a little bit about your ventures and just get stuck into a little, a little bit more, a uh, little bit more information there. Um, Chris, I wanted to to start with you. Um, you know, patient story sounds kind of really fascinating to me because, you know, one of the things that's happening now is there is so much more data around. You know, there's, there's medical records. There used to be paper medical records. Now there's electronic. Now there's all the sensor information from things like Apple Watch and wearables, and you know, there's a, there's a whole kind of data chunk to kind of navigate out there. And I think there's a lot of interests 
in, in many different parts of the ecosystem, but where's the data sit? Who owns it? How do you access it? And I think you've got a really interesting so solution to some of this. So could you tell us a little bit about you know, what was the problem maybe that you were trying to solve with Patientory? Yeah, so just to put everything into context, my background um, really has been an HIT, HIT consultant. So um, I did a lot of the early electronic medical records implementation for uh, mid-sized health systems. Um, then I actually went to work with, uh, and helped build an early telemedicine company, um, which really you know, got me thinking about the interoperability challenge that, especially in the US, has been, you know, um, really plaguing the industry for, for over a decade. So, you know, interoperability as we start to digitize data, um, a lot of these data, electronic medical records, created walled gardens that, you know, made it really inaccessible um, to retrieve information, especially as we look to um, start to bring on platforms um, such as virtual care, you know, harnessing patient data and who actually gets to see that data um, is one of the most important aspects of that. Um, so fast forward, you know, um, in starting Patientory, we were looking at creating a, a, an infrastructure, you know, that would actually um, assist with that. But at the time, you know, we were also seeing a rise in, you know, just the chronic disease epidemic in the U.S. So, you know, at the time in 2016, oh, roughly over 150 million American adults, which is about over 40% of the population, had one or more chronic conditions. Um, and the ability to manage that, we didn't have that infrastructure from a data point to really start to look at, you know, which groups were high um, in that realm of becoming, you know, diagnosed with a chronic disease, um, which would eventually become high utilization users of the healthcare. Um, industry, which you know is one of the third largest deficits um, for the U.S. economy. Um, so, you know, we were an early pioneer um, and, and researcher behind blockchain, mm -hmm. the, the technology that mm -hmm. now powers Bitcoin, um, and looked at providing it a, an infrastructure that would help to, you know, address the HIPAA regulations, the HIPAA landscape, um, but also being able to integrate data from, from all these disparate sources. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, that's why we decided on actually using blockchain. Um, there are pre previous in, in initiatives such as HL7 and FIRE, um, which we also integrate that is the predecessor to our platform. Um, they've, they've done more or less the heavy lifting um, and have a, a number of consortias um, in the country that that you know, collect data throughout um, different healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. um, so being, being part of those initiatives, you know, sitting on the health information and droppability committee for HEMS, you know, really helped in, in, in pushing that forward. Fantastic. And give me give me a sense of, you know, if I'm using as a as a as a patient, patient Tory. Um, do I see all of my medical records in your interface? I mean, how, how does this, the storage work? Or do I see a snapshot? Or, And I'm also curious about, you know, if I move, say, from Atlanta to Washington, you know, what happens with my medical records? Are they all linked up in the US? I'm guessing it's a fiendishly complicated uh, uh, area that. But tell us a little bit about how that works. Yeah, so I would say, you know, if you're familiar with any of the um, Cryptocurrency wallets that are out there today, you know, essentially you, you download the app on the app store, you create a, I would say, patient bank or wallet, um, which then you register and you, you retrieve a private key and a public key, um, mm -hmm. which creates your identity on the, on the blockchain network. Um, and then from there, you'd be able to search your, your health systems um, on the mobile app. Uh, mm -hmm and your dates of services, which is, and your, with your MRN number, so that's one of your identity numbers um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a medical record um, to be able to tag your, your, your um, medical record to, to that date of service um, on the network. So it's secure um, that that data is, is not stored on the blockchain. Um, it's stored in its you know, cryptographic encrypted um, decentralized storage 
um, mm -hmm. system, which the hospitals act as as nodes as part of that system mm -hmm. and the blockchain really acts as that, that I would say file card. So if you go to the library, you know, you can, you can search yeah. for boots. Um, you're able to retrieve your data that way. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And um, I mean, some of the benefits, tell us a little bit just finally about some of the benefits perhaps to if you're the clinic or the healthcare professional and the patient, what are some of the benefits that you're seeing? Yeah, I would actually speak to, I would say now. So as, as we go through, you know, COVID-19 and, and, you know, building something for, for chronic diseases and being able to pivot to pandemic, we've actually received a lot of requests and, and working through um, a test right now with a large employer organization that it's looking to really hone in on the health and wellness of their employee workforce. Yeah. Um, so the benefit in that is, is being able to um, really track. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have a symptom tracker that's tied to the network. Um, employees are able to consent their organizations legally um, mm -hmm. to see certain parts of, of their health information, with, with, mm -hmm. which helps with that back to work initiatives. Fantastic. So that really sounds like you're empowering different parts of the ecosystem, but particularly the patient and their con control and access to their data. Yes, exactly. Because right now, I would say, you know, no one owns their health information. <laughs> it's owned by the hospital system or the electronic medical record company mm -hmm. that has been lobbying for, for years against opening up, you know, access to, to private information. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissa. Um, let me move on to, to Jamie um, and Cl Cloudflare. Jamie, I mean, you spoke a little bit about you're trying to really democratize you know, healthcare in, in the US and you know, it is a very diverse uh, kind of country. Tell us, a, I'm, I'm really curious, you know, tell us a little bit more about what it feels like from a, from a customer perspective. So supposing you know, I've got COVID symptoms, uh, you know, I'm worried, uh, how would I use your service? But maybe, maybe I don't speak English. How would I use your service to really help me? Yeah, well, you know, the consumer market, interestingly, Matt, is a little bit newer to us. We just launched our virtual visit platform from that perspective this month. And the way that would work is a patient would call in from home and we've got some remote patient monitoring tools that are being integrated into the platform right now. So we're able to check heart rate and temperature, um, heart rate variability, um, you know, all those different types of things, blood pressure, pulse ox. And, you know, you can tell when someone is out of what there would be considered their normal band um, and then have that come up with a filter that says, hey, uh, you know, would you like a visit? We noticed that your temperature is at 102 for a sustained amount of time. Uh, we think that, you know, you should be talking to someone about that. We should be navigating you uh, to what is the appropriate point of care in hospital. And by the way, an interpreter can be added to that at the push of a button. In hospital, we have our go-to market is the iPad Pro, and we roll that device to the bedside. It's usually on some form of cart, um, or it could be attached to a wall, or it could be someone walking into a room with it. And we have an app, and um, they are able to click a button, not knowing what language that patient is speaking, connect to one of our operators who will help them figure it out. If we already know it, they can go directly into a language queue for a Spanish interpreter um, or a Arabic interpreter. We have 50 languages in video, 250 in audio. So we pretty much cover the entire globe from that perspective. And then that patient, because communication is the number one diagnostic tool that a doctor has, it's not testing, it's actual, what's your patient and family history? Tell me your history of present illness. You know, I'm, I'm getting nods from Ray there, which makes me feel good because I know I'm on the right path here. Um, but, you know, it, it, that's a, a, what we really need to do is empower patients to tell their stories because it's those stories that make them human and it's what helps them connect with the doctor. And, you know, if a patient walks in clutching their chest, the doctor doesn't know if that's a chest pain workup or an indigestion workup. And the only way you figure that out um, you know, quickly is by talking to the patient. So you roll this up to the bedside, hit a button within 30 seconds, we connect you to a live certified medical interpreter in video. Most of the time, if we don't have someone in video, we'll get someone for you in audio and they can tell their story to the physician and connect. And it's very empowering. You can imagine that an emergency department is a very scary place to be. Uh, when you speak English, when you don't speak English, it's absolutely terrifying. People are running around, maybe putting in IVs, all these different things, and you just have no idea what's happening to you. So 
we look at it as a patient empowerment tool, but we also look at it more as a provider empowerment tool because there's a lot of anxiety a provider has when they're trying to care for these patients. So their ability to communicate with the patient is key. And then what we've done as of late is we've added other services to that same device. So if someone is coming in and they have a stroke, they can hit a button and bring in that telestroke physician who may not reside in the community because uh, it's an underserved area. And by the way, there are medical deserts in some of our nation's biggest cities. This just isn't an application in rural environments. Mm -hmm. And they can then bring in, and if that patient speaks Spanish, they can bring an interpreter into that same call from a multi-party standpoint. And so it's really amazing. When I want to make myself feel better, I go and I stand in the middle of one of our language centers, listen to all the different languages being spoken, and know that each one of those conversations is making a difference. Yeah, that's, it sounds amazing. It's just doing such great work there. I was just interested you know, on the translation piece. So you, of course, because there's a lot of specific language, isn't there? And it's very important to be precise over that language. So you tell us just a little bit about, so you, you train specifically in medical terms and uh, with, with your translators. Absolutely. Um, these are the most highly trained interpreters that you can find in market. They go through 100 plus hours of training before ever taking a call. They go through a third party language competency test. Um, and there they're continually being um, you know, monitored by managers who are walking the floor uh, for quality control. And then um, you know, from the standpoint of uh, continuing education, every week they're meeting to discuss specific terms uh, that might come up. We have trainings by specialty. So there's oncology training, pediatrics training, um, and it runs down the list of different specialties like that to make sure that they can appropriately interpret because interpret, interpreting versus translation, translation is how you take that written word and convert it to another written word. Interpretation is more about painting a picture of understanding to make sure that the patient understands what's happening to them and the doctor understands what they're saying. And in many languages, there's not a direct interpretation or translation for a given word. And so you're using other words and lexicon to do it. And trust me, uh, you'll, you'll hear a lot of times where people are talking about it and it'll be in a specific language and then it'll be like MRI. And then they have to go into speaking about you know, what an MRI is. So um, those types of things are definitely critical to the process. Very, yeah, very, very skilled and important role that they have, yeah. How did you, how, what, was, what was your impetus for starting this? Yeah, interestingly enough, my partner, who I founded the business with, had an uh, experience where he was in Mexico and something happened to one of his family members. And he wasn't able to speak with the doctors and it was an incredibly trying experience you know, um, rife with misdiagnosis and a slew of other things. And he came back to the United States and said, you know, this has to be happening given the diversity of the U.S. every day, millions of times a day. Um, and so, you know, he really founded the video medical interpreting industry back in 2003. And then I joined the company in 2008 and we ended up pivoting the business and really focusing on expanding the impact of it because that's what we as entrepreneurs really care about. It's how do we positively impact and move the industry forward. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a critical part of the process. And we started adding other services to the platform so that we could do exactly that and solve physician shortages or nursing shortages or bring dietitians and case managers into communities that didn't have them. Um, you know, that's, that's all part of the game. It's a great, it's a great story. I, I mean, I'm interested actually with what you were just saying in terms of distribution, how, how do you get awareness of Cloudfare out there amongst your, uh, your community and the physicians and yeah, so, uh, you know, we consider what we're doing, we call it load balancing the healthcare system, because right now, when you talk about how the healthcare system is stressed, that in person visit up until COVID and COVID has been a huge catalyst for telemedicine. I think that's mm -hmm. widely understood here in the United States, especially. Um, we've seen telemedicine visits go up, you know, a thousand plus percent since, uh, you know, safer at home mandates and shelter in place mandates. Um, mm -hmm. But largely it's been, you know, word of mouth and then a sales team. We don't mm -hmm. really do any advertising. It's just been the fact that the service brings a tremendous amount of value to our partner hospitals mm -hmm. and they end up telling other partner hospitals. Um, which is, by the way, the best way to grow because it doesn't cost you as much. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we've definitely made a lot of investments in sales and education yeah. and things like thought leadership and being able to lead what is the digital transformation of healthcare here in the United States. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, I could talk much more about that, but uh, in the interest of time, Jamie, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me move on to, to Ray, um, Ray Bright, MD. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit just 
how, you know, what was the original problem that you were trying to solve and how did you start, get started? Sure. I found that the most interesting problems to solve are actually the ones that are big and ubiquitous enough that people forget that they're actually a problem. Uh, what we've seen in healthcare is that uh, in many markets, this isn't just in the US, but there is, a, there is challenges around patient access, and provider burnout and controlling the cost of care. And uh, those are just a few of those, uh, what I would think of as symptoms. Uh, the real underlying issue that we've seen around many, if not all of those problems ends up being a pretty foundational economic problem of supply demand mismatch. We have more patient demand than we have provider capacity. Uh, and if you dig one level deeper than that, the interesting thing is, uh, and you'll notice I picked my words carefully there. I didn't say we don't have enough providers. It's that we don't have enough provider capacity. Uh, and clinicians spend an appalling amount of time on administrative burden. And we've seen this being the case certainly in the United States, but uh, really in, in all developed nations, this is a tremendous burden that clinicians have. They're spending more than half of their time on things that aren't value add to clinical care. It is really around that administrative burden. And so that combination, that thought process is really what led us to be creating RightMD and that process of care automation. We're here to unlock that ocean of capacity that's there with the clinicians that health systems already have uh, and, and really solve those problems, make the clinician's jobs easier, make the connection to patients better, and really bring humanity back into healthcare. In a lot of ways, the things that patients experience in the most negative way come from the fact that we've put all of our clinicians on a treadmill, and we've told them that they need to be seeing more patients in order to keep up with this rising demand, and in some markets, many markets, even falling capacity where we're actually having a harder time attracting in clinicians and retaining them. Uh, they're going into specialty care or becoming entrepreneurs or whatever else it is that they might be doing instead of uh, into direct clinical care. So that's the foundational issue that we set out to solve and are really excited to have brought that kind of efficiency and consistency and value to the process. Great. And um, looking at the size and looking at some of your products, it, you know, I can see that kind of the, the screening and the, tr the triage, before uh, practice, even I, before I as a patient even engage it with the healthcare professional, that would seem to be kind of hugely beneficial in terms of driving efficiency. Yeah. Maybe, Ray, you could uh, give us maybe the example of COVID and, the, you know, how that's worked in practice. Yeah, well, I think the interesting thing is that there's a lot more triage is necessary, but it's insufficient for care delivery. Triage acts as a signpost. It can tell a patient where to go or where they are likely to need to go to be able to get care, but it's never the actual answer. The best thing it can do is say, well, it looks like you should go over here and make an appointment or you should go over here and call, uh, call an emergency services, uh, but it can't give you a diagnosis. You can't get a prescription. You can't get your care delivered. And so that's the distinction. I would think of if we're a virtual medical resident, I would think of a triage platform as kind of a virtual nurse advice line. It's a tool that can help you find where to get care, but it can't get you to the care. The distinction is we actually enable care delivery with diagnosis, prescriptions, referrals, orders, that full suite of care delivery with a physician in the loop and evaluating that care. So we're here as an empowerment tool to the clinicians, not as a substitute for their judgment, but as a supplement for their workflows. And I couldn't help but notice one of the questions that came up in the feed, this question about can AI take today's telemedicine to the next level? That's what we do. I mean, we use conversational AI to make it so that we've taken the most expensive human resource on the planet, which is physicians and particularly US physicians, although that's consistent in many different markets that that's the case. And we've made them 20 times more efficient. So instead of spending 20 minutes per visit, they're able to deliver care that has a 90% adherence to evidence-based best practices and patient and provider satisfaction scores in the high 80s and low 90s. And they're doing that in just two minutes of provider time per visit. Fantastic. And thinking perhaps of post-visits, I mean, does your offering also help there? I'm thinking of things like prescriptions, delivery of prescriptions and claims uh, against the payer. It does, so it links into those systems. So we haven't, uh, because there are purpose-built tools around those kinds of services, 
we're not looking to be prescription fulfillment, uh, but those back end connections into it. So your prescription should get seamlessly sent to the pharmacy for fulfillment. And whether that's delivery to your door or whether you pick that up on your way uh, home from work, that's really at the, at the healthcare consumer or patient's choice. Uh, and so we certainly facilitate those. And the same thing, if we're a care automation platform, part of automating that process should be creating a submission ready billing file. Clinicians shouldn't be spending their time creating billing files. Uh, mm -hmm. So we create those and send those over as structured data into the practice management platform for submission with existing processes. So we're big believers that you only disrupt the workflow where it truly creates value and you should fit seamlessly in through integration into those workflows wherever possible. So that's been part of our philosophy of product from the very beginning. And that actually triggers another thought, which is, you know, talking to all of you and, and thinking about Chris's, uh, you know, offering and uh, things like medical records, you know, does that, how does that show up? Does that get integrated in your offering as well? It does. That's a critical part. So if you think about, again, as a virtual medical resident, your job is to gather all of the available information that's relevant to care. And to Jamie's point, the majority of that actually comes from the interview. And so our ability to automate that interview in a truly dynamic, adaptive, personalized way is the, the biggest part of the data that we gather. But it matters what season it is. If it's July versus January, you do have a different risk of influenza and we need to be asking different questions. Uh, we need to be pulling information from the medical record. If you're a 42-year-old uh, a, uh, woman, we're going to be asking different questions than if you're an 84-year-old man. Uh, we want to pull in meds, allergies, and problem lists, the same things that a resident would be pulling from the medical record to fuel that conversation, that interview that they have. We reach into the EMR, do that review, and use all of that, and then we put it back where it belongs. So you want your up med lists updated. You don't, want the, you don't want that information stuck in a note somewhere, even though it is a structured text file and not a PDF. You want that updated as structured data. We push that back the way that it belongs. That virtual medical resident wouldn't have done its job if it didn't update the med list. Uh, so all of those are processes. This is bi-directional uh, connections yep. that not only automate the workflow in the moment of care, but really all of the downstream workflows as well. We found that to be also a really critical point of differentiation and value. Fascinating. I mean, I'm really interested with you know, AI and how much more potential there is to, to go with it, AI. And I guess the answer there is a massive amount. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's, um, you know, your imagination starts running, running with it. I mean, for example, when it comes to uh, not diagnosis moving into treatment options, does yeah. AI have any role there to prompt or suggest things to the physician? We do that. In fact, I think it's a key piece. So I think about AI again, I think often early AI utilization in healthcare was there to help identify the one in a thousand cases that the clinician needed support around and they didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And that's a valuable use case. In, in my medical training, they had an expression. They said, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses first before zebras. Uh, and I think that the vast majority of AI applications in healthcare have been focused on the zebras. Uh, and it's great. And when there's a zebra, you really want to make sure that you identify it. And that is a high value use case. But our application of AI has really been around a different approach. It's about taking the 99.9% .9 of cases that really we want to be uh, streamlining that workflow uh, and really taking that approach to it. Uh, and I think by taking that approach, using AI not as a substitute uh, to clinician judgment, but as a supplement to their workflows, we found a totally different opportunity to be able to help patient provider experience and clinical outcomes. Uh, and we're currently, we've applied that to more than 50% of primary care visit volume here in the United States and Canada. Uh, and that's very applicable in other developed nations as well. And this is a problem that we see in other developed countries as well. You look at Great Britain, they wanted to move from a five day a week model to a six day a week model. And what kept them from being able to do it clinician capacity. This is a truly global problem. It's not unique to the U.S. And while we've targeted the North American market first, it's one that really we, we see as being a, really a ubiquitous and global problem for healthcare as a whole. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I totally, uh, being from the U.K., I, I totally understand that. I mean, last question, when you wrap up all of those benefits, Ray, that you've been describing, you know, what kind of, is there a percentage efficiency or, an, or a number that you could put on 
you know what you're contributing back to the healthcare system where you where you operate? Yeah, so uh, we currently support care for about 50 to 60 percent of primary care visit volumes. We've grown that also out into mental health, dermatology, musculoskeletal, pediatrics. And uh, we've seen a couple of different ways to be able to measure this. So on a per visit basis, we're seeing about a 90 percent improvement in efficiency. Uh, so we're, we're reducing the amount of time that clinicians have to spend by about 90 percent. Uh, we're seeing patient time to care. Uh, in a traditional telehealth setting, that's typically a couple of hours. Uh, we're seeing about six minutes of, of patient wait time from the completion of their interview until care delivered with prescriptions as appropriate sent to the pharmacy. Uh, and that's, again, about, uh, so for, actually you asked about COVID, uh, we have now saved more than a million minutes of clinician time around COVID visits, COVID related visits alone since February. Uh, so that's a very quantitative approach to the to that value creation. That's, uh, that's a massive amount of clinician FTE or capacity that we've created purely with software. Amazing, amazing, fantastic, really, really valuable contribution, especially when there's a, not only a capacity issue, but a demand pressure as well from things like COVID. Yes. Great, thank you, Ray, that's fascinating. I'm gonna move on, Howard. Uh, Last but certainly not least, LifeWire, <laughs> which again, yeah, fascinating because again, I've been looking at, you know, what what you offer, and I'm going to let you explain it because you'll do a better job than me. But customizing communications at scale, yeah, which is a no mean feat when you're talking about thousands of different clinics, different types of customer issues. Tell us a little bit about how you've managed to to solve that problem. Well, and, and in general, too, what everyone's talking about, and to Chris, uh, Jimmy, and, and Ray, in terms of what we're trying to do is to, you know, the, the value proposition is provide access to care anywhere a patient happens to be, anytime they want to have that care and on using any device that they want. So you want that intervention and the instantaneous communication. So it's truly using the power of, of the cloud, as it's, as it's called then. In the old days when I did it, the cloud didn't exist, which is servers, but now they're clouds. <laughs> and really what we've done is, and, and, and you've heard elements, again, we're all aiming to do the, have the same objective amongst this group that you're seeing, different ways of element on different elements. But what we're really using is the power of the cloud and the power of natural language and artificial intelligence and key elements to what patients want. You know, the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of the information, you know, is the same. Is the same. And in terms of administrative work, you know, have, you know, we reduce 80% of the administrative work is the same. So we're trying to have help to have the, you know, the physicians and clinicians work at the top of the license as opposed to dealing at the lowest end of their license. And the way to do that is using natural language. It's using taking our clinicians and the physicians and the health systems, depending who the client is, uh, protocols and validated assessments and literally automating that process and taking how the users provide that information. Basically, what we, what we see ourselves is anytime the patient is outside of a clinic or a hospital, that's where we kick in and tie in all these various elements. And our system is designed to pick up those differentiations in terms of the part of the country. Because the, you heard earlier in terms of, uh, you know, Ray was talking about, you know, a 42-year-old woman and a 16-year-old man, if I got that correctly. You also have vernacular in different parts of the country. Across the U.S., there's so many different vernaculars being used in use of language, you know, just amongst a group of four of us from where we come from. And what our, we've designed the system is to be able to pick that up uh, understand the nuance and, and deliver them to where it made, what makes the most sense. Now, the trick to all that is, um, then you get in a whole discussion of security and privacy and, and insinuations, you know, mm -hmm. is how do you, what different levels do you have? And quite honestly, with our clients, we have different levels of interpretation, interpolations, and, you know, in, in, across the board in terms of how specific or how much you want to interpret all that um, mm -hmm. becomes a whole other issue that we're trying to, we try to manage. But it really starts at being, because it's cloud-based and because there's no software literally for the clients or the patients, we're, we centralized that process. So in terms of ease of managing it all, it's dramatically changed because mm -hmm. it's 100% centralized. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we own our own servers. It's our own server farms across the U.S. So we have 100% control of the system as well. Fascinating. How would give, give us a sense of sort of what it feels like as, as, a, as a patient. Because I guess that... Um, 
there's a huge amount of things that after I've been to see a healthcare professional, maybe I've got a prescription, maybe there's med, you know, regime not have to adhere to, maybe there's you know, checkup appointments and, and post care. C can you give us a sense of what it feels like uh, as a customer, or a patient using your system? Well, it's, it's a good question because part of it is it's one thing to be able to have the communicate. We do a lot of presentations called the art and science of communication. It's one thing to have the platform that can communicate and send information. The other thing is how you're communicating, what language you're using. I talked about it earlier. So the patient gets uh, outreaches as, um, as friendly and as familiar as, as, as the patient desires or, or requires in order to get them involved and engaged. But part of that is engaging them is not just asking them a question, but it's actually giving them feedback. So if you ask them a question, did you take your medication today? Or however, you know, very simplification is giving them feedback is that's great. That's not good. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So you're giving them active involvement because by the active involvement, you're actually engaging them further into it all. In terms of how they engage with the system, it could be our clients are reaching out to them on an automated basis or quite honestly, and what, what's being used a tremendous amount, in, particularly in terms of the COVID world, where patients are reaching in by just literally texting a keyword um, and they initiate the entire di dialogue and the system just navigates them through to where they want to go. Mm -hmm. But the key thing is to be as friendly as possible, but as responsive as possible and giving value. Because the, the patient doesn't feel they're getting value from that relationship. You know, and if you're hearing variations on that, they're just not going to get involved. Mm -hmm. and, I, and is it branded from the healthcare professional? Is it, is it kind of white labeled? So it's got the... So if I've gone to a particular clinic in Atlanta or, or, or Oregon, does it, does, it, is it, does it appear it's from that clinic or is it from your branded service? Absolutely. It's, it's, fully, it's, it's fully white labeled. Because the last, yeah. I'll, do, I'll do with it, I think it's the greatest names in sliced bread. The last thing a patient wants to see is you get a message from LifeWire and they're going good. I've got enough junk mail, I've got enough junk text messages or whatever the case may be. So it's fully branded too, so they know where it's coming from. Um, because again, it goes back to how do you engage? Well, that's the first level of engagement is so they know it's coming from a trusted source sure. to begin with. Great. And tell us a little source. bit about... Um, and now it's been a real, a real oh. that... No, go ahead, please. Uh, oh, sorry, I just was going to set, set, sort of segue into the benefits back of the healthcare professional, or the, the clinic or the hospital. Um, you know, when a patient is receiving those communications as if they were from the, the hospital or, or the clinic, what, what are some of the benefits that the healthcare professionals are seeing? Well, the benefits is, and again, you've heard, again, the value proposition is, is, is very much where because you're automating these relationships and the patients know they're automated. It's not, it's not a secret. You're allowing, and as it, the clinicians operate at the top of the license. So a lot of these processes, they don't have to worry about, but they have this within the system, it has an outreach. So if a patient responds a particular way or the algorithms is, they said X to A and this to B and that to C, it, no, it can be reach out to the clinician in real time or reach out to the system in real time. So they set the parameters or take our products where it's already built in. So they, are, they, they hear from a patient when they want to hear from a patient. And therefore, they're able to manage the patient group that they, they want to deal with. A very quick example in terms of, you know, uh, Ray mentioned the VA. So our, my first client was actually the VA only because I didn't know any better. And so... <laughs> I was going to say, that, that, is a, that, is not a, that is not a curse I would put on most people. Goodness. Uh, good yeah. for you, and Howard. So we've, we're, you know, if we've, we've just entered our 12th year working with the Veterans Administration. And it, it, quick, you know, very quick story. We do. We're working with maternal care program, and what that maternal care program does is it allow, it provides a clinician every morning. They get a list of all the patients that they need to speak to that morning. So instead of having to call up a 250 or try to take a guess as to who may need their help, because they know 8% of the population need help today, and how do you determine that? We help them determine who are the ones they need to follow up with. Uh -huh. Fantastic example. Great, Howard. Thank you. Thank you for that. It sounds uh, an amazing uh, service you're offering there. Panel, I'm going to shift tack a little bit now and just talk a little bit about some general questions um, and more of a kind of rapid fire. Uh, so sort of to get ready. Um, first off, the new COVID, the impact of COVID, 
the new normal. I don't know if the, in the US if you're even thinking about the new normal just yet. But, um, you know, clearly COVID had, a, I mean, we see it, we're talking about telemedicine earlier, we saw an eightfold increase in telemedicine consultations in Asia. Uh, the feeling is here, I think, that things have changed and probably won't go back to the way they were in many areas. What's your, um, what's your view of what the new normal looks like for your particular venture? Um, I'm going to just go around. Jamie, what, what's your view of that? Yeah, look, um, I used to run an ER hospitalist and anesthesia group here in the United States. And in speaking with them, I still sit on their board. And, you know, their volumes are down 30 or 40 or 50 percent, even depending on the site. And people have largely avoided going to the emergency room, which was the de facto primary care provider for a lot of people who never bothered to go see a primary care physician um, and get hooked up with the system in a, in a continuous type of way. So um, their prediction is that a lot of those visits aren't coming back, some will, but that if you take a look at closed healthcare systems and Howard and Ray will know this from the VA, if you take a look at the VA and you take a look at Kaiser, who can really control how they interact with patients, over 50% of their visits are currently done over telemed. And it's important to understand what telemed is defined as then. It's email, it's phone. Phone is still an incredibly viable telemedicine device. And it's video and it's all those things. It's, you know, chat. Um, but over 50% of their visits are, are, are done over telemed. And I think that shows you what happens when you've got a little bit more of a, a closed market and, and what can happen in that environment. So yeah, we, telemedicine for us is here to stay. Patients have built a lot of muscle memory with telemedicine. They understand its convenience now. They understand that they can actually receive high quality care over it. Is it right for every situation? Absolutely not. But is it, should it be integrated into the daily practice of what we, what we do here in the United States and be part of larger digital transformation of our system? Yes. Okay, and thank you for that. Ray, same question to you. I would imagine it's had a huge impact and probably a lasting impact on your business as well. Yeah, we've definitely seen this. I think the new normal is a complex one uh, and in part it comes back to the reimbursement models. And I think there were some questions that came in around that. We don't have enough time to be able to dive into all of those, but I think those are one of the core, For in the, in the US, uh, there are regulatory restrictions around where healthcare can be practiced, uh, what tools can be used to practice that healthcare. So like the, uh, Chris had mentioned the HIPAA compliance. That was something that was uh, temporarily waived during the emergency crisis situation. Uh, and then there's uh, how is it reimbursed, particularly at the federal level. Uh, and all of those are regulatory issues. Those are still settling out. And I don't think we know exactly what the new normal is, but it will feed into part of what Jamie is saying. The thing I would say is that in some ways, uh, that's a question of, of how quickly will we get to that new normal, not what is it. Uh, I think there has been a substantial and differential impact for health systems that are digitized. Uh, folks that are direct to consumer have that digital presence were impacted notably less negatively. So companies like Teladoc, uh, who is a pure, purely virtual healthcare delivery system here in the United States, saw a substantial windfall from the utilization that was driven from COVID, whereas traditional health systems with more bricks and mortar and infrastructure costs actually saw a negative impact to their finances. That means that those new entrant competitors are now better equipped from a capital standpoint. They've gotten more market traction. And I think the true new normal is in some ways irrespective of the reimbursement landscape. The reimbursement will drive how fast we get there. But uh, if you don't think as a health system, uh, as a provider, if you don't think about your digital presence and the digital tools that you're using to connect with patients, you have already relegated yourself to a distant second place. Uh, mm -hmm. And you have empowered those folks who are out there looking to be able to eat your lunch with a direct digital uh, service. Uh, and so that to me is the most clear and present uh, new normal. And I suspect that that's not just in North American markets, but truly in all developed nations. Yeah, no, I'm sure you're right there, Ray. Um, I'm sure that's gonna be the case in Europe as well as Asia and the US. Um, let me, flip to another question um which is and this came up a little bit before but when you're thinking about your venture and where you might take it next in terms of where you're operating um from what i can see although all these healthcare systems have got their own nuances and differentiations within marketplaces there is also a lot of you know cross relevance from what you're doing to other markets do any of you see asia is somewhere that you might be interested 
in expanding too. I can see Ray's nodding his head, so I'm going to come to him in a second. But Chris, any view of patient Tory for you um, in terms of not necessarily just Asia, but do you think there's a role for you outside the US? Oh, Chris, you're on you're on mute, by the way. Um, no, absolutely. Um, we our company is definitely a global global brand. When you know when we started our company, um, we actually issued. Um, through our foundation, one of the first healthcare cryptocurrencies that was supported by over 2,000 investors, um, primarily in, in Europe, um, Asia, and the Middle Eastern markets. Fast forward to that, you know, we have about, you know, a, over a dozen ambassadors um, in eight different countries, including South Korea um, and um, Singapore. Um, who currently work within their local geographic regions on blockchain and healthcare adoption and use cases. Um, we also host a global conference um, in Dubai in the Middle East, um, looking at new applications of healthcare technology, such as blockchain, AI, machine learning, VR, um, and its use in the healthcare setting. So while, while we, we have made a lot of, of definitely traction um, in the U.S., um, we are actively building in other areas as well. Okay, hey, Chris, uh, with an international event, I'm curious, something you had said earlier made me really think, I mean, in some ways, you're almost a cloud-based card vital, uh, the French the, the French card vital model. Is that, is that am, I, am I capturing that? Uh, that? That certainly seems to have international implications, if that's the case. Yes, I am not familiar with that, but I, I would assume that that would be part of it um, with, with the global expansion of the network on which our software sits. Okay, um, and Ray, you were nodding your head vigorously in terms of expansion, what's, what's your- Yeah, that? I think there's two parts to that answer. So the, the part of the answer is if the, the United States is one of the most fragmented markets in terms of a payer models. It is arguably the most fragmented market out there. The place where we actually are able to create the most value is with health systems, much like what Howard talked about, the VA, where it is a single payer type model. Uh, and if you look at other developed nations across the country, or across the world rather, uh, those are all in some form or another, whether it's the Bismarck or the beverage model or, or uh, something else, uh, those are all in some form or another, at least more of a single payer model, where the cost of care management is an incredibly important part of the, uh, the economics of healthcare, even more so arguably than in the United States. The flip side of that, uh, and this was in somewhat in relation to a question that came through about advice for health tech startups wanting to expand to the US, I'll mm -hmm. answer it in the other direction. Um, I have heard it said that if you can make a health tech company work in the complex uh, tangled market of the United States, you can make it work in most other markets. The other direction is not necessarily the case, and I would say that either direction is not as easy as that statement might make it sound. Internationalization, uh, from a technical standpoint, is not difficult, but there are a number, I mean, the, the models are different in each place, and I think it behooves companies to be really thoughtful about that expansion. Singapore, as an example, is a market that we would look at in Asia uh, as being a very logical next step uh, because of a number of different aspects that really align the care models, uh, the economics, uh, some of the cultural aspects. I think there are a number of things that make it um, a, a good landing spot for a move into Asia. Yeah, yeah we, we see that a lot. Singapore is often a, a, you know, the springboard into Southeast Asia and beyond. Here. Yeah. Listen, guys, uh, I'm going to have one question and then we'll, we'll final question and then we'll wrap up. And actually, Ray, you started to answer it there, which is, um, you know, many of our audience run startups and health ventures themselves. Many are thinking about, you know, the reverse journey from Asia to, to the US. Any, any tips or key learnings or things that you've learned on the way that might be of help to an Asia startup looking to go to the US? Howard, let me start with you. That's a... <laughs> Can't say run away, it's, Howard. It's, that's it's not a, it's allowed. It's a very good. Oh, oh okay. Sorry. That's, that's, that's one of my preferred one. Had I known any better, actually, what I tell, um, I, actually, I speak a lot on behalf of actually the U.S. and Canadian governments about mentoring companies uh, going into the states. Mm -hmm. And the key, one of the neat learnings are is to understand that the U.S. you know is a very particular market. And all due respect to all of the Americans that we are, 
there is nothing else outside of the United States. So regardless of the success you may have had in other countries, the context you need to put it in is how does it relate to the American marketplace? Um, yeah. And it's, it's um, there's, a, there's an open door for solutions. There's no question. Everyone wants to hear what's going on. Um, but it's a, it's a long haul. It's, it's, you know, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So you said to get prepared. It's, it is a long haul as you go through that. Just prepare yourself accordingly. You will find, you know, the success is there, um, but you've got to put the time in to do so. And unfortunately, you know, the best ways of doing that was frankly is to go to the major markets as much as those are an experience on their own to go to HIMSS or ATA or health or the very, various want the connected health conferences it's a great learning to understand about the american marketplace and literally having come from canada into the states in the past 15 years it was you know if there is a journey you go through in understanding what it is um it is it it's not for the faint of heart to say i, I might layer on top of that you know, just the, a little the bit. desire for oh. sorry you were cutting out howard i apologize Please go ahead keep going no no go ahead go ahead ray Oh, I was going to say, I might layer on top of that. I, I mean, the United States health market, I would argue that it is actually not a, uh, it's not a single market. Uh, it is complex enough that it is actually an ecosystem. Uh, and you have to understand how those pieces fit together. To your point, Howard, I was really looking to reiterate what you're saying there. Um, you have to understand those slices uh, and then you have to segment. Uh, so the value that you create for, a Kaiser or a VA, which is a closed entity and where they own the cost of care is entirely different than a Midwest fee for service hospital system that makes money by filling hospital beds. Uh, and I'm picking two obvious extremes, but I mean, there are a whole bunch of nuances in there. You don't come in and move into the US market. If you do, you've made a mistake already. Understand the market well enough that to know that it's an ecosystem, pick a part of it where your product creates differentiated value, land a beachhead there. Yeah, I think it was Jonathan Bush, who I saw recently quoted on this, that you know, while healthcare is a $3.2 trillion part of our GDP, it's actually made up of hundreds of billion dollar markets. Um, and so that is an awesome point that Ray just made. The other thing that I'll tell you is before you go and say, well, we're gonna yeah. take our product to the United States, get that one incredible reference account. Like before you go out and hire a sales force, before you do anything like that, Get that one health system that you can convince to use your product, learn from that experience, make all the adjustments you need to make on your product or your solution for the US market, and then use that reference account to start getting other accounts. That is a key part of the model. If you can come out and be like, hey, yeah, we, we're working with the Mayo Clinic, that's gonna open doors and people are gonna listen to that. Um, yes. That's a key part of the, the expansion strategy for anyone coming in from outside the US and even for people inside the US. There have been a lot of talk about even Silicon Valley not understanding how to build healthcare startups because people are coming in from the outside thinking they can change mm -hmm. it, but healthcare largely has been changed from the inside out and you need to have clinicians who are giving you input. You need hospital administrators who are giving you input. You need payers who are giving you input. So set up that great advisory board, find that great reference account, and you will save yourself a lot of headaches. Great advice, great advice. Any last uh, thought, Chris, from you? No, I would say, you know, to, to just reiterate and, and echo what was said, you know, started out um, in the US, we actually went international and then came back um, because we actually found it, it was easier to, to innovate. So coming into the US, you definitely have to make sure that you know your, your, who your customer is, um, you have your value prop um, really succinct and, and you know your, your business model and, and how you're going to actually persuade if you're looking at direct to enterprise healthcare products, um, you know, health systems to work with you because it is a large, you know, a long sales cycle. Um, that can run anywhere from, you know, 12 to 15 months at, at most for, mm -hmm. for most companies. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Panel, thank you so much. We're out of time. I really could, uh, it's a cliche, but I really could spend another hour talking to all of you. Uh, fascinating ventures. Um, you are doing amazing work, all of you, in, you know, really pushing the innovation, but more importantly, really helping the the patients, the healthcare clinics, and the whole ecosystem to become more efficient. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. I'd love to see you guys in Asia. 
I hope we get the chance to talk to you again at some point. Thank you for Thanks having so us. Thanks so much. A pleasure. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Right, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.